seats. I know it was a short coffee break, but you can watch Jacques' keynote like you're watching TV. Coffee, pastry, what have it. Um, so I would like to introduce our next keynote, uh, Jacques Latour. My colleague is the Chief Technology and Security Officer at CIRA. And as he would say, he wears many hats. Um, today, he will be putting on his siftier hat. As over the last year, Jacques has co-chaired two working groups at the Canadian Forum for Digital Infrastructure Resilience, the Canada Cyber Resilience Working Group, Yes, the acronym CCR was purposeful, and the Internet Resilience Working Group. Just as Canada's diverse terrain and weather affects how we build networks, it also affects the reliability and resilience of them. And as the climate crisis worsens, it's never been more important to make sure that the internet is available 24-7, 365. So I would like to welcome Jacques to the stage to talk about his work for us. Uh, this work for us and where we can and should go from here to improve the reliability and resilience of Canada's internet. So, Jacques. Thank you. Hello, hello. Well, I'm really happy to be here. I got lots of, I think at the end, we're, um, we're gonna end up having more questions than answers and that, that's a goal here. Um, also, I got, I can't wear my hat here, but, um, I'm also uh, with ICANN this morning. Um, I'm in the Security Stability Advisory Council with ICANN. I also chairing the TLD Ops uh, Working Group within CCNSO at ICANN. And that's a uh, security of around 200 CCTLDs around the planet. So we co coordinate all of that. Um, I'm also on the board of the Ottawa Gets No Internet Exchange. And a lot of this ends up being uh, internet resiliency. Um, I guess the last two years, uh, there's been a lot of focus, a lot of work that I've done around internet resilience. Um, I like to think myself as kind of a chief internet, can, chief Canadian internet uh, person, one that can guide the, the, the Canadian internet in its direction. Um, and today, it's all about resiliency of this. Um, so I think we have, the, the, today I'm talking about internet resiliency, which is the infrastructure of the internet, not the top layer with application and AI and all this. I'm talking fiber infrastructure, cable plant, wiring, routers, which is the bits and the bytes to make the, the, the infrastructure layer of the internet work. So we'll talk about resiliency. Um, we'll define what resiliency is. It's a choice that people make, organization make to define how resilient their access to the internet is. Um, we did a lot of public private work for improving and evaluating the internet resilience. Um, there's been a lot of, so that's where I want to focus because we're doing a lot of work there and it may or may not go at the right place. It, we should have a better way of governing the internet infrastructure than we are today. So. This is a, when everything you hear today, you need to figure out, okay, if I'm, if the internet is multi-stakeholder, there's a bunch of us that governs the internet, how do we create a governance layer for the infrastructure for the internet today? And I'll try to hint on some places what I think we should be doing, uh, but I think we need to figure out how we align the governance and the implementation. Um, slowly green button. So the last couple of years have been pretty uh, active in terms of unresilient event. We had the uh, Fiona hurricane that caused a lot of outages and impact in the Maritimes. Uh, and then we had a Roger uh, outage that occurred. And when this when these two events happen, a lot of people are, and a lot of organizations are now thinking, how come, I, how, come I, how come my internet went down for a day, two days, a week? Uh, how come I can't do online businesses, you know? I'm supposed to have reliable services from the ISPs, but when your network connectivity is not there and it takes days to come back, 
there, there's things that people can do to have a choice to, to be more resilient with internet access. And resiliency is uh, using the Wi-Fi and the Starbucks could be a resilient mechanism for people, but you can, people can do better than this, depending on what their requirements are. Um, so there's been lots of outages. If we look at the, some surveys we've done, there's a lot of disruption uh, in Canada, so caused by extreme weather. So coast to coast, um, there's a lot of issues that happen uh, by weather that impacted the resilience of the internet. So a landslide in BC cut a bunch of fiber along the railroad and who that effectively it split Canada in two because all the fiber optics that we have, they all run in a single point of failure in the view of that uh, 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 mudslide. The resiliency is how do we build an infrastructure in Canada to be resilient against those kind of events? So who's responsible to say, you know what, maybe we should have a ring in Canada, maybe we should have a different architecture and that's at the macro level of the internet. This is huge. This, it's not a Syrah, it's not a Canary, it's not a Bell decision. It's somebody, we need to figure out, we need to paint a picture, a vision of what our internet should be in Canada so that it's resilient against this. So there's tons of layers. You can look at the Canadian internet from a home user, from an ISP, and then their resiliency is how do we assess how resilient it is based on, and then figure out what we need to do to implement. And then we've had um, ISP outages and, and weather. So there's been lots of, well, Roger obviously is the big one that caused a lot of impact. And then that forced us to put together a plan to document uh, as part of CIFDIR, the work we're doing. Uh, we put a plan to a recommendation to the minister on what we could do better. Um, And then that, so when we did that process, we ended up defining uh, what reliability and resilience is. Because everybody's got their own definition for this, so we had to come up with something that was clear. So we define what reliable services are. So we wrote a document, uh, we, and then we made a bunch of recommendations around that. And we, we also have critical infrastructure providers in Canada, and then we try to define what the resilience is uh, for that. Like, what is the acceptable level of access to the internet that a critical provider, uh, infrastructure provider needs to have to support, you know, weather, human error, cyber attack, all of that impacts resilience and so on. So the Defining what reliability and resilience is, is fairly complex issue. Just at the infrastructure, depending on if you're a home user, all the way to a large scale ISP. Um, so there's been lots of work done at that layer. Slowly. And this is where we did that SIF there. We've done a ton of work there. Um, so, but there's a bunch of activity that happened post um, Roger and Fiona with CRTC. They did a bunch of uh, consultation. They, they look at the outages. They came up with their report and how we could be better or not from a CRTC, CRTC point of view. Um, so that, Sivdir was not involved in that part. The CSTAC is the sister organization of CIFDIR, so that, that's a telcos, uh, Canadian telco organization. Um, and the important, the, I think the important keyword here is telecom on top. So there, there's a bunch of things that regulate telcos to do activities in their infrastructure, but that's not the internet. The internet is unregulated. So if we make recommendation that impacts regulation, then the telcos will do something. But if we make recommendation that 
that impacts the internet side of it, then they don't need to implement the, the activities. So an example of that is, you know, we build a bunch of internet exchange in Canada. We, should, we recommend people to peer at them, but there's no, no way of getting people to peer at internet exchange when it's the internet and there's no regulation and there's no mechanism to force that. So CSTAC, they made a recommendation in their own ways to address the internet resiliency issue caused by Roger, Roger and uh, Hurricane. And also I think there's mudslides that were part of that assessment. And then the CIFDIR, um, so this is, that there's a, it's mostly public sector, pri private sector. So it's CIRA. There's about 20 organizations that are part of that. Uh, Assign is part of the, how many are part of CIFDIR here? So three, Canary, so, and the Internet Society. So our goal there is, if you go look at the, the website, there's a lot of work we're doing on many working group. And one of them is the Internet Resiliency Working Group. And we wrote, a document on how to assess internet resilience. And then we made recommendation to Minister Champagne on a bunch of things that Canada should do to enhance the internet resiliency. So resiliency, the first challenge comment that we had was people think redundancy and resiliency is equal, and it's not. And that defining what it is and what are the acceptable level of infrastructure access uh, was a kind of a challenge to put that on paper. So if you, you know, re redundancy is if you have two cars at home and both of them are electric cars, that's fine. Resiliency is having one car that runs electric, the other one with uh, fuel. And then, you know, if you run out of electricity, you can use one car. And then if you run out of fuel, you can use the other one. And that's resiliency. Then when you apply that to the internet, it's good and bad, and recommendation can go against uh, what the, the market expect. So we have challenges in making recommendation to make the internet more resilient. When we say, you know, bundling is, uh, that's what the telco sell, they sell internet access and mobile phone. And well, that's redundancy because both are using the same telco. Resilience is having a phone from company A and internet from company B, and that is resilient. And then you need to add that at all layers, and then you build up uh, resiliency. Critical infrastructure player, um, we have requirement or guideline to be super resilient for Canada, and then we do our best to implement resiliency in the infrastructure. So for .ca, for example, the .ca, the DNS, we have a highly available infrastructure. It's resilient and it's uh, available. So we've done a lot of work on internet resilience. And the challenge is how do we align the governance with the implementers? So people are implementing, are infra all the infrastructure provider together have the internet. They, they build it, but we need to align the governance with it. That's, a, that's my observation, is trust people, for people to trust something, I think we need to look at a new model where you need to align, to build trust, you need to align the implementer and the governance together so that it works. And today, so the arrow is, the bottom part is layer one, two, three, that's the infrastructure here. We need to figure out how to align the governance and the implementers. So with CIFDIR, you'll see after, we generated a bunch of recommendations. It went to Minister Champagne, it went, it was made public. There's a lot of good stuff that we did, but it went, in my view, it went at the wrong place because the government can't do anything with those recommendations. And then this needs to go to some sort of a governance body that we need to figure out. And then we can take that and then work our, the recommendation back in. So that's kind of the lens on, is it possible? Can we do that? How do we achieve that? But I think once, if we start doing that, we can build trust 
uh, in the infrastructure that we have. Yeah, the little green light does the thing and, oh, did it go three, four slides now? No. I was slow. All right. So the first thing we did, this is public report. You can go download it. That's a link down there. Just Google for this. You'll find the report. Uh, that we've, this is the, the website for CIFDIR. And then you'll see all the different working group we have there. Um, so we made the, rec so we made the, the recommendation post the, the Roger and Fiona. Uh, so CCR, the working group, we generated a report and these were based on the pillar of ICED. So for a robust network, coordinated planning and strengthen, strengthening accountability. So we had a, a report that was structured around this way. And we, the example of, you know, we need to strengthen, so one of the recommendations, the key one, is we need to strengthen multi-stakeholder governance. So we need to have more collaboration between CSTAC, CIFDIR, and CRTC, industry, and all of them. And the, the challenge here is we make it. We, we, the internet is now kind of a critical infrastructure, and we need to have a better governance to operate that as a whole. Right now, they're all operating in silos-ish. Even though we talk to CIFDIR, we talk to CSTAC, we don't speak the same language. They speak regulation, telco, we speak internet and open internet, and CRTC has is, is got a different thing, but there's no global way to coordinate our effort from a uh, internet resiliency point of view. Um, we made a lot of recommendation on improved peering and interconnection. So when you look at the base, an internet is a network of networks. And networks interconnect together. And the more you interconnect the networks in Canada, the more resilient it becomes. And to do that over the last 10 years, we supported the development of internet exchange points. The internet is based on inter on internet exchange point connecting work together. Sorry. Um, so we have IXPs all around Canada, and many organizations don't connect and peer at those ex internet exchange points in Canada. That would go a long way to increase our resilience. Um, and I think the, that if, if there's anything coming out of today, we need to find a way to get more ISPs, more telcos, more networks in Canada to interconnect in Canada and exchange traffic. And if anything, that's the, 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 the number one thing. Um, so we had, we had a recommendation to create a new position in, in the cabinet for more oversight over the internet or cybersecurity. And then to look at the resilience of the internet. Um, so that's, yeah, I talked a little bit about this already, but IXPs, like I said, it's a core piece of the internet. I think we have a good infrastructure, but it's not being used as efficiently as it could. So I think there's a couple of people here from IXPs around uh, the country. Um, it's more, you know, the internet is moving to the edge now. There's more and more content at the edge. And local peering of networks in, goes a long way in doing this. So I think we went to a lot of details to document what to be done here to improve, improve access. Um, but I think we, we were, the recommendations are not going at the right place here to be action. There, I think we spend a lot of time in, the, in our reports talking about the difference between transit and transport. And there's a lot of recommendation in there that we need to build, we need to acknowledge what transport is, and we need to build more transport capacity um, in Canada. So transport basically is from your home 
to the ISP, there's a fiber, there's an infrastructure that's transporting bits. It can be vendor A, B, C. Transit is internet access. Once you can reach the whole internet on top of transport, you can access the whole internet. And um, so there was a lot of analysis done there because during the router outage, they have their, their transport provider for a lot of organization. And then, but they don't, it's when you buy transit, you don't really know that there's a common transport provider in the back. And if that common transport provider goes down, it can impact multiple internet service provider and that impacts the resilience. So in Canada, we need to understand macro level, who are the transport operator? It'd be nice to know who's, who's transporting our internet data in Canada and where are the single point of failures? And then if we know where there's single point of failure, then we can fund or make recommendation to build around those, to build resiliency, or at least for people to understand the resiliency. Of. So in the end, we started with a project, super simple. We want to provide guidelines or make recommendations for internet resilience. But to do that, you need to understand how the internet works. It, it gets, every time you dig in deeper in the infrastructure, it becomes super complicated. There's lots of details that are uh, super difficult to grasp. So that was a kind of a, a challenge there. Another, this is something we've been talking about, is building a trans-Canadian backbone. So today, you know, just like the railroad, we should have something like this, a ring around Canada that with a strategy to build infrastructure, to build some sort of a capacity to interconnect network and build resiliency in, in Canada. So we made that recommendation, but this is, like I said, that, that's a lot of work to implement. And then, but if we build a vision and it's got this, and then we build the internet, uh, there's a way potentially we could build internet, our future internet with a vision and a governance, I think would go a long way. So this is, we, part of CIVDIR, part of the Internet Resiliency Working Group, we wrote a guidelines for assessing internet resiliency for home users, remote workers, small business, enterprise, and all the ISPs. It's a nice document. It's just taking forever to make public. It should have been public today or last week or last month, but it's being translated right now. And as co-chair of this working group, I'm pushing to get it done, but there's other forces at play here. But this document explains in detail from a home user how to get resiliency. And it, the example here is if you work from home, don't buy bundle services. If you want resiliency, you should have ISP A for your internet, ISP B, uh, second mobile operator, different than the other one. You gotta tell people, you know, transport. If, if you want a resilient infrastructure, you gotta make sure that the transport provider are different. So if you're, for example, is if you use tech savvy that runs on top of ISPA and then your mobile's on ISPA, you, you don't have resiliency. So there's a lot of, it's, it's complicated. So we tried to make it simple and explain all of this. And then it would have been a lot better if that report was available before this talk, but that's okay. So, In, in the beginning, we wanted to have an open internet. And I think what we meant is we wanted to have an open, unregulated internet. And what we need is to move toward a standard-based, open, trusted internet. And the trust is multi-layer. And in the infrastructure, we need to build trust that, you know, we in Canada, the infrastructure to run the internet can be trusted by people and that people understand how to build resilience in their services. Um, it's becoming more and more critical infrastructure. There's a lot of work we need to do, but in the end, when we make a bunch of recommendations that are going to Minister Champagne, 
the office and then it makes its way down in the government machine. It's not, it's not the right people that can act or in that group. We need to have a different, a different governance model around it. I'm not sure what it is. And, but we have a lot of work to build um, the internet in Canada. Sir? Hi. So, Jacques, you mentioned that uh, your what's, what's your name? It's Tim Denton. You were just talking to me outside. I know, but they don't. Oh, I see. <laughs> okay, it's Tim Denton, chairman of the Internet Society of Canada chapter. Now, question. You said your report was went to the Minister of Industry, Trade and Commerce, or whatever his current title is. Is that correct? That's right. So, Minister Champagne. Champagne, yeah. So, why is why do you say that it's directed to the wrong place or that it, he's not entirely the, the right actor to receive and act upon your report? So I'll, I'll pick an example. So part of the, the, the recommendation is for the networks in Canada, the large network like the Bell, Roger, those guys, to connect at local internet exchange points and exchange traffic locally. So... That's a recommendation to make more resilient, let's say, for Fiona. But if the, if the Minister of Industry does not have jurisdiction to cause there to be connection at exchange points, because it's not under the, you know, it's not under the... Um, the regulation. It's not, a, it's not a regulated enterprise. Is this an argument for regulating Internet exchange points, or is it an argument for pressure to be applied by the minister to bend some, twist some arms and get some cooperation. Uh, do you have a suggestion? So I do, well, we, we need to have a public-private governance model of some sort where all, at, you know, in, in the Fiona example, everybody in the maritime should, there should be a governance body there that says, you know what, I want East Link, Roger, Bell to peer, and when we lose access to the rest of the world, at least whatever is accessible locally still works. Instead of losing all the internet, you have connection. But the recommendation to force, I don't know how to force an ISP in Canada to peer at an internet exchange. There's, they, they, they do their own thing, but if everybody complains or the governance has power to influence telcos, then we need to do something. But the recommendation that we did, you know, it. it it applies to everybody, but there's no way of enforcing. Not enforcing, but to get the buy-in. So. I would say more, but I don't have the microphone. It's off there. <laughs> or you can have the microphone. Thank you so much, Fabio uh, Pocalvi, Concordia University. It's interesting to see these discussions of resiliency connecting so much to the kind of glowing climate emergency and the fact that the Maritimes have been hit by another tropical, like another tropical storm just this year. And so I'm wondering when you're talking about the, how, how much is this becoming part of a conversation about climate adaptation? And how much is that becoming part of the language about when we think about network building, we're thinking about building? Uh, in, in, in ways that have to adapt. And then in particular, you know, I didn't hear much about kind of the last mile. I was just wondering what, uh, what recommendations you had maybe for last mile adaptation too, especially because that's changing so much with uh, mobile and, and 3G PP closed standards. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so last mile. So, in, in, so we made a bunch of recommendation, but the, the example for last mile is if you're going to, if so, there's a lot of money being given to telcos to build new infrastructure for broadband ac accessibility, and they always reuse the same pole. They, they keep adding more fiber to the same pole. They should put stuff underground. Resiliency is putting stuff underground, stuff in the air, you know, fiber, wireless, or, or whatever. Uh, luckily, we have Leo, the, the low, lower bit satellite with internet access, that adds a level of resiliency, but it's not super affordable. Um, so I think 
I think a lot of stuff, but I, you know, we, we spend a lot of time working on the architecture of the Canadian internet. It's the, the Canadian internet is a thing and it should be architected. There should be a, a governance or a team that, you know, on the hook for that. And when the government or networks or Enbridge decides to do something, then maybe we can piggyback fiber on Enbridge to add resiliency because they got on the pipeline. Maybe hydro electric networks could be used to enhance the resiliency. Um, to have multiple rings where if you have, there's a landslide that we don't cut the country in two. But there, today, it's ad hoc, if any, architecture. And there's, yeah, so we need, we need to be better than we are on that. Bonjour Jacques, j'ai une question en ligne um, de Garth Graham. He says the original Canadian backbone was multi-stakeholder governed, but to achieve a market-based policy framework, the federal government sold it to Bell Canada for one dollar. Are you suggesting that we have to move beyond the market-based policy framework? Tim said yes. <laughs> That's what I will answer. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that is. Maybe I should know. I'll talk to Tim. <laughs> but the backbone is something we've been floating for a long time. On, I think in the recommendation, you know, it says maybe Canary should play a, a role in building a backbone uh, in Canada and making that a service to other networks. And I think that would go a long way in A, bringing speed and access all around Canada, north, south, east, west, um, coast to coast to coast. Um, it would go a long way in adding resilience and capacity. And then, you know, if you do something, you do be the first country to do terabyte per second, coast to coast, public infrastructure access. There's a lot of innovation we can do there. But, oh, zero. That's it. So that was the last question. And I'd like to invite the panel one, pros and cons of regulating AI on the stage. You don't need that. Welcome everybody to the um, panel on the pros and cons of regulating AI. My name is Megan Wester. I'm a Media Studies MA graduate from Concordia University. Um, my research has been focused on public procurement and AI governance, which led me to work in, uh, as a policy analyst and foresight analyst, uh, which in turn has fed research on desirable futures and particularly citizens' desirable futures, uh, which is on team for today's event. 
la session se déroulera en anglais, mais n'hésitez pas à poser vos questions en français à la fin. We'll keep questions for the end. Uh, we have a really exciting panel today, um, and I'll invite the panelists to uh, introduce themselves. Um, I was going to start with online, if we see Pratik Sibal. Hello, hi, hi Megan, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Hi everyone, uh, I am Pratik Sibal. I am a program specialist at UNESCO. I am based out of Paris, so was not able to join you there today. Uh, I am primarily dealing with uh, files related to artificial intelligence and capacity building, focusing on uh, governments as well as on the judiciary. But of course, I'm anchored within the overall work of UNESCO on the ethics of artificial intelligence, which as you know, is a standard setting instrument that was adopted in 2021. I'll stop here and looking forward to the discussion. Maybe starting with Beth on the other side. Hi, I'm Beth Coleman. Uh, I'm a professor at the University of Toronto, and I'm uh, the research lead on AI and society at the Schwartz Reisman Institute for Technology and Society. Hi, everyone. I'm Mekit and we met. Uh, feel free to call me Mark. I lead global artificial intelligence policy for Amazon. And I'm Femme Kalbi. I'm an associate professor at Concordia University. I'm also co-director of Concordia University's Applied AI Institute. I'm speaking here on behalf of my own research, largely around artificial in AI governance. Sorry, AI governance in Canada. Thank you. Um, to kick off the conversation, I would like to start with a rapid-fire roundtable question, um, and we'll again start with critique, and then go for furthest towards here. How has generative AI changed the AI governance landscape? Well, it's uh, everyone is talking about it. It's let's start with challenges. I work in the communication and information field, to uh, democracy, uh, to elections, to disinformation, and how it has made automation of disinformation so much easier, and that's that's a big challenge for us. Uh, the challenge also remains on how the media viability uh, issues will, will, will evolve as we go along with uh, use of generative AI in newsrooms, uh, how do journalists use it, and then of course there are the challenges around uh, hallucination and, and so on, and whether we can really trust uh, the, the output of generative AI. So from more systemic challenges to more granular ones, let me also bring you something from the judiciary where uh, we're working on guidelines for generative AI because the judiciary is left, right, and center trying to use chatbots uh, and, and coming up with rulings. And we've seen cases in the US, for instance, where uh, they cited previous case law, which did not exist. So there are a lot of concerns with how people are using uh, generative AI and uh, including in the judiciary, including on intellectual property rights issues, we have cases going on on that. So uh, across the board, I think we can spend a lot of time just breaking it down by different silos, but I'll stop here. Back to you, Megan. Thank you. I'll pass it to Ben. Um, so uh, agreed, agreed on that list in terms of where the challenges are. Um, in general, we did not have a legislative environment around AI until very, very recently. So what we've seen is uh, just a, a shift in terms of public uh, sense of things, public participation, and also public concern in terms of the anxieties of what is this technology? It's in my hand, and yet I can't even trust what it is. And uh, to work in silos, the whole list in terms of misinformation, uh, hallucinations, et cetera. Thank you, Mark. Well, I think it's, you know, it's, it struck the public's imagination very quickly. I mean, AI has been around for a long time. We've had many forms of AI applications that we have been indirectly as consumers and citizens interacting with, but this was probably like the, the zeitgeist moment where, you know, everyday people were interacting with something that was strikingly good uh, as, a, as, a, as a product. 
um, with obviously the pitfalls that, that, that have been uh, laid out. So what's changed most is I think just the public's perception and understanding of where AI is at uh, was the first thing. And then the second thing is it was an immediate challenge to some of the various regulatory approaches to artificial intelligence that have been put forward uh, that we're now trying to grapple with how you could encompass uh, generative AI solutions to the regulatory approaches that they had taken thus far. And then the last thing I'll say is um, there are there were concerns that were floated up uh, relatively quickly of um, risks associated with the democratization and the broader availability, especially like the open source debate of, um, of LLMs, uh, especially around uh, potentially national security risks. Thank you. Anything to add? I think, I think for me, the challenge with generative AI is, is almost a, a kind of forgetting at this moment because I, I think as Mark was mentioning, AI has been around for a long time and yet really we've seen the attention for generative AI really eclipse some deep and long-standing concerns. I think one around the way these technologies are being used in, in surveillance and facial recognition technologies. You know, now we're talking about AI safety suddenly and as though you know, that's kind of fallen off the agenda. I think some of these deeper issues about data power, competition, and certainly kind of power of certain firms certainly is, is something that might have been, uh, is, is certainly in the background, but a lot of this emph emphasis now is on, say, uh, you know, f far off possibilities of general intelligence. And, and really, there's a, there's a challenge at work about kind of returning to some of these kind of fundamental principles of AI in general. And so I think that that's a kind of clear gap where we can't have generative AI eclipse the entire AI conversation, particularly some of these ideas of what legislation was pending and, and, and losing sight of that. The, the second point is I think there's been an interesting opportunity. We've known for a long time that worker activism is really fundamental to tech regulation. We've seen that uh, in Google's work around Project Maven. And really what we've seen interesting is new stakeholders become involved in these conversations around AI governance. And we see this already in the past panel on the G7 concerns about labor. And now I think prominently what we see is that uh, new actors, particularly creators, are becoming more involved in this AI governance. And I think that that's actually an exciting part. One of the opportunities is to see a wider coalition of stakeholders involved in these governance issues. Yeah, thank you. And perhaps as a as a way to um, to parse the conversation between um, the disruptions of generative AI and, and the broader AI governance conversation, I would invite Beth Coleman to uh, provide us with a definition of generative AI, maybe a working one for today. Uh, so, I mean, what we have with generative AI, and this comes from the shift in. Um, neural nets, as you guys all know, in terms of the architecture of what's going on with AI. So fundamentally, generative AI is predictive models. And if we think of something small and domestic, like autocorrect, um, what word is correctly predicted to fill in the blank? So but then if you take that framework of a model that predicts based on a giant corpus of LLM, um, largely Anglo, Anglo, is there a giant Francophone LLM? I don't know. The ones that I know about are, are Anglo. Um, so there's already a framework in terms of what's the language, what's the syntax. With that said, what we're seeing is prediction that then becomes generation. So when you, for example, put in a sentence in ChatGPT and you say, rephrase this for me, copy edit it for me, what we see is prediction around a better version based on uh, having read a whole corpus of white papers, et cetera. So that is kind of an everyday example of what we've all experienced now in terms of generative AI and moving from the predictive to the generative. And it's really powerful and it's really interesting um, and the idea of the possibility in relationship to also the risks is, is a, a tremendously exciting uh, conversation that we're having right now. Thank you. Um, so as we, we've been discussing a lot has been happening this year in the AI landscape. 
Uh, Mark, could you provide us an overview of what's going on among Canada's key international partners? Um, sure. I mean, there is a, I would say it's frantic at the moment. Um, so when the EUAI Act's been coming uh, for a good while now, I mean, we were in my previous job part of the high level expert group planning it out in 2017. So it's, it's not new, but it's likely to be adopted by the end of the year or at the very least Q1 of, of 2024. Uh, I know the Spanish are, are very much hoping that it happens under their uh, EU presidency. So highly likely that that gets ad adopted uh, by the end of the year. Then in three weeks, you have the UK AI Safety Summit, which um, Prime Minister Sunak has gotten very deeply behind, and that's more indexed towards frontier models, um, existential risks, and kind of some of the, the concerns associated with, with that, but at a still quite high level, ministerial delegations and so on, with the possibility of um, new institutes being set up and new kind of multilateral agreements to tackle that side of the discussion. In parallel to that, the G7 has something called the Hiroshima process in place, which is um, an attempt of having a, a, a multinational slash multilateral set of commitments on the responsible deployment of artificial intelligence, which largely mirrors some of the work that was done uh, by the White House uh, in kind of putting up the, the White House voluntary AI commitments to which kind of Amazon was a, was a signatory. So all that's happening in parallel at the same time. And then in Canada, you have Bill C-27, which includes IDA, the AI and Data Act, uh, which is currently at the committee stage of review. Um, and then I can go on and on and on with, I have an Excel sheet tracker with more than 150 different bills that are currently proposed. So we can talk about many other jurisdictions, state, local, municipal, federal. Um, I also wanted to open this question to Pratik, perhaps, um, to, if you had anything to add to this, to this context of the international landscape. Sure. I think uh, it keeps evolving so fast that it's it's hard to track. Uh, I, I would love to have uh, the Excel sheet from Mark. <laughs> yeah. uh, as, <laughs> uh, so in addition, there's, of course, the GPA, which, is, uh, which was established actually by Canada and France and uh, which is also having several working groups uh, and is working on tangible projects uh, related to artificial intelligence. At UNESCO, we, had the, we, we also have a global forum on the ethics of AI coming up in Slovenia next year. And the UNESCO recommendation on the ethics of AI is being piloted, uh, is being implemented in about 50 countries with a readiness assessment of where the countries stand and they're on a different stages. So all this would be kind of all the stakeholders would be coming around next year in Slovenia to share uh, their experiences and building up this kind of governance knowledge around AI uh, from different parts of the world. So, so there's that, but uh, I recently was uh, engaging with the African Union, which is coming up with its conceptual framework on artificial intelligence. Uh, it's a continental framework and it's quite interesting, the kind of multi-stakeholder work that has gone into the draft so far. And uh, there's work which is happening at the Internet Governance Forum. Uh, next week, I will be in Kyoto where there's a policymakers network on AI. There's a lot of interest amongst parliamentarians as well. So there's a bunch of activity internationally which is happening in addition to what also Mark just mentioned. And just really quickly, like it's not like all of this is well coordinated between these different bodies, right? There's a ton of overlap and confusion and direction and duplication um, that we kind of have to parse through to understand kind of what's coming out of where. Yeah, really important to add. Um, now narrowing in on Canada, um, Fenwick, what's going on in the Canadian landscape uh, when it comes to AI regulation? Yeah, I think I'll echo Mark's comments about the coordination issue, because I think that's one of the real key kind of challenges here. And you're catching me as kind of an academic trying to write up a report on the state of AI governance in Canada. And it's really marked by a, a long period of, of movement and, and big gaps in what's happened. And we, we saw that a little bit, uh, I would say, with Brenda's comments earlier around G, G7, uh, on the G7 panel, just talking about a lot of people being caught by surprise about where ADA comes from. And if you're doing my own research, 
it, you don't see the, the segue from necessarily the Eddy committee into the, the ADA process. So I want to say that, yeah, there's a bunch of moving pieces. Some of you might be able to follow this frenetic pace better than I am. Some, and that's one of the challenges is also being able to keep track of it. So in the state of trying to keep things a bit simple, I'd say that one of the things that's happening in Canada right now is this interesting shift where a lot of the kind of AI policy and governance has really been focused on research and industrial policy. And now what we're seeing is, I think partially because of the generative AI turn, more consideration of the social impacts and social consequences of that. And that becoming a larger, more pressing issue. So partially the shift we're seeing is this kind of awkward transition between the two. In terms of what's happening on the ground, I'd say that we have a lot of big pieces that are shifting and moving with implications for artificial intelligence. So we have the reforms to the Privacy Act, PEPIDA, on C27, which has like large consequences. We also have, and I, and I add this kind of gets into some of the challenges, we also have changes to C11, which is the Broadcasting Act. Also some concerns, I forget the name of the bill now, C17 around cybersecurity, uh, proposed online harms all touching upon various aspects of artificial intelligence to speak to kind of this coordination challenge. In tandem, we have work being done in particular in Quebec with Law to, uh, Bill 25 around changes to the privacy law that are working it here. So in one sense, the context is changing dramatically because we see the kind of fundamental issues around AI changing. And just to say that the Office of the Privacy Commissioner is currently investigating ChatGPT around its uh, compliance to PEPIDA right now. So these have impacts for, for model, model development, and what's happening. In tandem, and this is quite interesting, is that there's been a lot of work around Canada and positioning itself in the international uh, play field. And that's, I think, a really interesting, always challenge, because how do we see this translation between very normative international statements and kind of on the ground impacts? And that's, I think, a really interesting part of watching that transition play out. Possibly there's some work around the U European Union in establishing treaties around artificial intelligence, which create interesting opportunities where maybe human rights frameworks can be embedded. In tandem, the Standards Council of Canada, that I think uh, Phil Dawson mentioned earlier, is coordinating work around AI standards globally, which is, I think is an interesting part of where we're seeing some of this take place. And I think then the final kind of point, the final two points is that we also see a move towards some uh, voluntary codes. And I literally was joking with Beth about this. I was on vacation for like two weeks this summer. I feel like that's when the generative code came out. So, uh, or, was, or was drafted. So all I say is that I don't know that one as well, but I think there is a push towards some ideas of, of uh, self-regulation self or co-regulation taking place. And then finally, and the kind of last one to say is ADA. And the Artificial Intelligence Data Act is a, it's kind of an open guess where we're going to be with that. As we've mentioned, there's been a promise of reforms for that bill, and it's very uncertain where and what's going to happen in terms of the next steps about ADA, but that would be my last place of a, this rough landscape. So we have from big structural pictures down to AI-specific regulation. We got it. Thank you. Great. I just, this was a great summary. Um, I want to, you know, Canada likes to talk a very big game about lead, global leadership on artificial intelligence, and I think it has big ambitions, but I don't think it executes very well against those ambitions, nor is it equipped to execute against those ambitions. Just staff-wise, if you start there, uh, you know, I spend my time kind of going around different jurisdictions talking about various forms of AI regulation and industrial policy and so on, and, you know, we have an infinitesimal size staff compared to, to any other country. I mean, in just the UK, you'd have at least 120 people in the equivalent office to what I said will have four or five, right? So it's, it's, it's hard to execute this amount of work well with just that thin of a bench. You know, so you talked about the code of practice that, that was came about. It's the same five people who were also nominally responsible for providing and drafting edits to, to C27's IDA, to drafting ultimately the regulations that are meant to inform IDA, to draft the participation of Minister Champagne to uh, the UK Summit for AI, which was the genesis of why they wanted in the first place uh, a code of practice to be able to have something to say when they show up there. And then, you know, any ranking that talks about AI as being in a leadership position globally really is massively indexing on, or very real successes on fundamental research on AI, you know, from, from historical happenstance of, of, not happenstance, the historical investments made by, by CIFAR and continuing kind of support for the R&D uh, ecosystem. But as all the productivity stats, adoption stats, 
industry stats show we are at the very bottom of the pack with regards to actually being able to deploy the technology. And we are not anywhere in the landscape of, of relevance on conversations around uh, both AI governance and an AI deployment. I mean, it's, it mirrors a lot of what we see with in the, say, the defense space or AUKAS or these types of alignments where uh, Canada is kind of no longer really seen as a, as a priority player. We happen to have a seat at the G7, which continues to be useful. But other than that, I don't think we should oversell how successful we've been and separate between what ambition is and what we're executing against. Can I just jump in super quick? Just say, I, I kind of echo that as something which is a real risk presently is that you know Canada has really tried to champion itself around this. And I think another area would be some of its work around algorithmic impact assessments where we saw Canada try to try to make a claim about being a leader. But that team, I feel like, has only had two or three people working on that. And the tool itself has been pretty modest in scope. And I think that there's a lot of fair criticisms about how that's been rolled out. But yet, yeah, if you don't have actually the investment in these kind of flagship projects, uh, you don't really have then that capacity of saying, well, we've had subsequent, we can demonstrate what that leadership has actually done. Yeah. These so we're going to talk about China in terms of impact in regulation and impact on the ground and working with industry because in some ways it's not the opposite of looking at Canada, but it certainly is a space where we're seeing a lot of activity. I was going to, um, to redirect this question towards uh, Pratik um, and as, as his expertise is really very much on that, so do governments have the capacity to implement and enforce regulatory frameworks for AI, and how can government build capacity? I think this, this question is very much um, connected to what we have been discussing so far before we circle back to the horizontal and vertical approaches to regulatory governance. Sure. Um, before I jump into that, I forgot to mention the high-level advisory body of the UN Secretary General. Uh, which the Tech Convoy's office is leading, and they received about 2,000 nominations, and this will also decide on a global governance mechanism. Something worth checking out as well. Uh, coming to capacity building, yes, actually, uh, there is a big challenge here. We are also focused on just getting the laws out that people are forgetting that you need mechanisms within governments First, as uh, some of the panelists were mentioning, to coordinate within government. This is a, a super, this is a very obvious thing, but it doesn't work in bureaucracy, is this kind of coordination. So that is a big challenge. And you need functional specialists related working on artificial intelligence who understand not only the technology, but also understand the, the legal, the privacy, the cybersecurity risks involved, around, the ethical concerns around uh, AI. And then you need also a management culture, which allows for experimentation in government, which allows for, uh, you know, a kind of a user listening instead of, instead of just kind of a straightforward process where you start with a product uh, concept, finish it without having any kind of user feedback. And these things are definitely not happening. We've seen the, the robot debt scandal in, in Australia, where uh, there was, they were using AI systems for tax fraud detection. Similarly, a government actually resigned in the Netherlands because of uh, the problems that they faced in an AI system that they were using for social benefits allocation and so on. And we need to invest a lot more in capacity building. And I know that uh, folks at Mila are also working, for instance, with parliamentarians to just inform them what it is what kind of uh, capacities are needed within government, and it's just not about lawmaking. And we're looking at the EU. Uh, we will have the AI Act, hopefully, towards the end of this year. And, and then there is a whole set, a whole mechanism which is needed to enforce it. And we don't necessarily have the competencies to be able to do that at the moment. So we at UNESCO have developed, for instance, a competency framework for AI and digital transformation, which can help identify what are the, the knowledge, skills, and attitudes that you need in governments to actually work with new technologies, both in using them within the government, but also in their governance more broadly. Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, so as I mentioned, circling back to <coughs> this, um, this more analytical lens to cross a cut, to cross a cut all of these different frameworks and uh, regulatory approaches. I would like to invite Beth to um, to kick us off on this question that will be open to all of you. Um, what are the key pros and cons of horizontal regulatory versus vertical regulatory approaches? So horizontal and vertical, I'm understanding as comprehensive policy and versus a categorical approach. So if we look at kind of a, a grid in terms of, I think, the primary countries that we were thinking about, if we look at the EU, if we look at Canada, the UK, and if we look at China, the EU is comprehensive, Canada is comprehensive, United Kingdom doesn't really fit in one of those categories, and China is uh, categorical in its approach. But in relationship to that, you also have different frameworks of the EU AI Act is risk-based, which allows for some capacity in terms of um, predicting things that are not yet established as harms, whereas the Canadian um, uh, uh, framework is impact-based, so it has to do with harms and demonstrated harms. Um, the UK is principle-based, and China, it doesn't really fit into one of those spaces. Um, so there's a way in which, if we're thinking about, and this speaks to both um, Pratik's comment earlier, the specificity of particular AIs and the spaces where they're used, and also thinking about as a fundamental aspect of generative AI, we don't have a solid state object. You don't have something that was made by Microsoft and then you have it on your machine and it just stays the same. Um, so we have, we've got that aspect to it as well um, in terms of the complexity of both applying regulation and making sure that it is able to be supported in the world, like the infrastructure around, what are we talking about? Periodic audits, once it's already passed a certain type of audit to go to market. Um, so those are the, the pieces that I would put um, on the grid. Thank you. Mark? Uh, okay. In my, you can define it a bunch of ways, but in, in my mind, horizontal is trying to have like the AI bill, right? That's going to try to the, the point of the EU AI Act, classify things as high risk or not, in Canada, high impact or not, and then have processes for um, essentially product certification schemes if you fall under the category that's considered high risk. And then vertical, I see more as, um, you know, if self-driving cars are, are regulated by regulations or bills under the Department of Transport or Ministry of Transport or whatever it is, medical devices under health and so on. Uh, so having kind of a vertical kind of sector-based approach versus a horizontal one. I think the horizontal one is problematic for numerous reasons. One, I think it's a Sisyphean task of trying to kind of capture everything and going back to the idea of having the institutional capacity to do this work, those same five people that we talked about before are gonna have to understand the, the, the specificity of things like medical devices and you know automobiles and so on and how completely different they are uh, in order to understand how to categorize like whether they are high impact, high risk or, or not. And I think that is a, a problematic approach because I think people who are closer to the use cases are gonna be better able to identify kind of where the risk actually lies. That being said, I think there are some ways to have a degree of homogeneity or horizontal um, assessments. So if you're going to try to deploy a risk management process uh, as a precursor to be able to deploy something that is considered high risk, um, then, you know, ISO 42001 exists, is about to be adopted. That applies across different verticals. Like that should be managed by a horizontal team. And I also think that you're probably going to have to have in an end state capacity to understand AI in the same way that people understand computers and understand electricity uh, in, in various verticals. But between now and then, you probably need to have uh, a, a function with, a central function with enough expertise to be able to float and work with those vertical approaches to help them kind of, you know, work through uh, those use cases. Last thing I'll say is, I, I think the EU 
its, its legislative approach is also dependent on the institutional structure of how the EU is built. Like, they're not going to iterate every six months on a new law, right? A Westminster system with a majority is capable of doing that. Um, and so I think following the path of the EU, because it was the first one to kind of lay a groundwork, um, was a mistake in the context of Canada because we didn't have to make that choice. You know, if you have an issue like uh, non-consensual deepfake porn, right, you can edit, uh, you know, you can make sure the criminal code is as precise as it needs to be on that if you need to, to modify existing laws to be able to deploy them, though I think aspects of existing law should be able to, to cover a use case like that. Or you can pass a specific bill that covers some of these things without having to wait for, you know, the one big bill to, to fix every single situation with a silver bullet so that every politician, everybody can say, done, we've done the AI thing. Now we're going to move on to quantum or whatever else the, the other thing is. It's an ongoing work that's going to be everybody's responsibility for decades. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that comes to the other question that there's democracy versus the other country. Uh, to add to to the panel that we that we've been the panel topics that we've been discussing so far today, um, I would like can you please provide your thoughts on why Texas is the best choice? Um, yes, so I was just saying that uh, this points to a new tension to add to the list that we've been discussing so far, um, the, this multiplication and mushrooming of, of policy documents versus um, uh, homogeneity or something that is more cross-cutting. Uh, we are close to time. Uh, Fenwick or uh, Pratik, would you like to, to answer to this question or should we move to the last one? If I can just quickly quickly mention one thing, that even without the laws, we do have uh, international human rights law, which can certainly provide protections when we are talking about privacy, when we are talking about discrimination and biases. So we should not, in a lot of places, we are in this uh, kind of conversation that, oh, we don't have anything. Actually, that's not true. So we are working with the judiciary and we are seeing judgments coming left, right, center in a lot of countries, uh, which are actually talking about biased algorithms and how uh, and finding companies. So we already have human rights law that can help us uh, in, in, in addressing some of the risks that we are talking about artificial intelligence. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I was just going to I was going to echo that. I think. The, one of the challenges is that there's a debate not between horizontal and vertical, between new law and old law, and whether do we need new laws or enforcing the ones that we already have. And I think I would make a powerful case that that's an important part of any AI strategy is actually ensuring that we have this capability. And I think the two points, and, and I just want to echo, I mean, I think one of the tensions, Mark, is when you're talking about this kind of move fast Westminster system, you also need to have the resources in place yeah. to do that. And I would really echo that there's a real gap now, less about ADA than just about the capability of the government to enacting that. And I think that that's a, that's a wide criticism of digital policy of the government presently is how capable have they been in a kind of due diligence about lawmaking. And that I think has then also kind of distracted from these ideas of whether we need new laws or do we be talking about more effective enforcement, which is I think a huge gap around tech policy long before AI and continues to be now. I mean, a sensible step one would have been start with a gap assessment of you know, which laws exist and apply and where do you have gaps and do, can you modify existing regulations or laws to, to help cover some of those gaps and where do you need new legislation to be able to bring in the right types of protection. But that's not very shiny. Yeah, no one likes talking about competition yeah. policy. Thank you. Um, we're at time for the discussion part of this panel. Um, it is now time to open for questions from the audience. Perhaps we could start with one online if there's one or in the room. Yep. Is it the same mic? Thank you for a really interesting conversation. Um, it strikes me when we are discussing the various models and your enthusiasm or apprehension around them, it's a bit of a Rorschach test on your faith in government. Because 
the frameworks themselves, you can say like frameworks are good because they allow for flexibility, they allow for things to evolve and government is, you know, uh, we can rely on government to do the right thing and to make the right decisions and to get, inform itself and blah, blah, blah. Or you can say these frameworks are terrible because they leave incredible amounts of uncertainty uh, for business and discretionary decisions for political actors who are in inherently politically motivated and who will not be well informed about technological advancement. And so therefore, it's really just a PR exercise, which I think was implicit in the last comment, which I, I, I have some sympathy for that point of view. Um, but I, so I wonder, like, are we really just discussing uh, having a meta conversation about whether we're confident that government can do things and act rightly. I, Mark, I, you'd yeah. like to take it first, yeah. I'm gonna parse or whatever, I'm gonna challenge the assumption of the question in saying I don't think it's about trust in government as a whole as much as saying one you know, new body under ICED will be able to understand every single use case better than their colleagues in transport, health, uh, you name it. I, I have faith in the individuals across government and in their ability to add additional staff and team to be able to equip them to, to tackle a specific use case. People in transport have been dealing with the automakers for 30 years, I mean, more, right? They, they understand those files, they understand, you know, the, the complexities of them. I think it is just an, and it's not literally the people or the government. I think if you took the five of us uh, and you asked us to draft the one bill that will cover every single use case, we're going to get it wrong. Like it's not about faith in government. I think it's the, it's the wrong, it's putting the challenge in the wrong place. I think if you ask individual ministries to be able to tackle it and equip them to be able to, to do the work well, I think they can do it well. The second thing I'll say is, it, this is not a theoretical question, right? If we say, all right, we're going to do this big overall bill and this high risk use case, we're going to, uh, we're going to define extremely broadly. We're not going to, we're going to take three, four years before we actually draft the regulations that inform how you go about complying with it. For those sectors, you know, this is not five years ago, like it's not a theoretical question, like deploying artificial intelligence with regards to your company's productivity and your ability to compete is very real. If you are not sending clear, you know, clear signals as to how you go about ensuring that you are compliant in order to be able to deploy that uh, technology, you're putting that entire industry or that vertical at a very real risk or disadvantage at the very least. So I think getting it right is extremely important. I think that requires seriousness in the approach of doing it. I don't think that this is a question of trust in government, because if we look at, let's say, the past decade of social media in relationship to government regulation, um, there's not so much to trust. It's been really, really messy. And that's not at the same scale of where we are in terms of advanced automation and with AI. Um, but there is a sense of urgency here that we do actually have to get it right because there's a lot at stake. And it's interesting and not just smoke, I think, that industry leadership has said, okay, responsible is a key word here. How can we make that so? And we're in an interesting moment in terms of how responsible is being interpreted and um, executed. Uh, so for example, I would be interested to see what the training data was for uh, OpenAI, and we might, because it looks like there's now several legal cases that might help to expose that. So I think there are multiple forces. I think one of the reasons this government and other governments have uh, taken um, visible steps is because there is an understanding that we need to, uh, I don't think it's trust, but we do need to find a better way to get this better and figure out how to keep working on it in process because there are many moving pieces. Thank you. Yes, there's another question in the audience. Yes. Thanks, I'm Paul Sampson, uh, Center for International Governance Innovation. 
you've all touched upon it in one way or another of the, the interface between the domestic and the international or the global here. And of course, we're seeing this technology diffuse digital AI in ways that is unprecedented, I think, in, in, in the globe. Um, how do you kickstart that, you know, to take up on the last point that we need to do something, right? If that is, if that is true, and I certainly take it as such, how do you kickstart that global conversation to be in parallel to all these domestic legislations or you know EU sized legislation? It's not enough, right, to do just that level. So UNESCO is doing good work, but it's not enough. Um, how how does this become a global issue, the way that aviation did or or nuclear technology? Yeah, Fenwick. Oh. Um, Uh, I, to, to me, I think there's a, you know, an ongoing challenge about how to harmonize those two. And I think that that's one of the things is that, uh, you know, the Canadian record in some ways of, of what, how does this international commitment actually translate into policy legislation is one I've, I've kind of witnessed the gap because you can hear these declarative statements and how does that actually inform the policy process. Um, I think from kind of going from uh, you know, it's going from a kind of top-up you know, approach of how to actually build global coalitions. To me, I think you, you are uh, trying to think about what are the kind of governance models that might be at work here. I think for me, one of the things that I'm quite interested in is is not some. There's some talk about ML commons, but I actually think about commons-based or commons-based approaches um, for looking at some systems, particularly generative AI systems that have been trained upon cultural works, uh, national, international, public, you know, public documents that has kind of obligations that must be met at an international level. So I think to me, part of that is kind of recognizing that specific natures of these technologies requires different governance frameworks that might have to function at, at an international level. Mark, you also Did wanted you to want answer. But I wanted to partake one or two. Um, yeah, leave it at that. Uh, sh sure. I, I just briefly wanted to comment that I think both approaches go together, right? When we were developing the recommendation on the ethics of AI, I, I think in about 2019, there were already over 150 AI, in e AI principles or guidelines and so on, uh, including in Montreal, which had a city uh, kind of a declaration and so on. So it's a good thing because this allows for global processes to be informed by uh, local, regional, national, sectoral processes. And then uh, I can say that the way the UNESCO recommendation was developed was through both intergovernmental discussions, of course, the negotiations that happened in the end, but before there was a long process of multi-stakeholder discussions at national, regional, with different stakeholder groups, which kind of tried to, to reflect all these uh, different standards that were emerging. So it, it was a natural process of uh, bringing different ideas together. Now, once we have these global standards, what we are seeing in, in, in places with these kind of organic regional or national communities didn't uh, spring up, we are seeing the uh, the tools being used, what I mentioned, the readiness assessment methodology and so on, to look at the gaps, which uh, Mark was mentioning before. What are the gaps, uh, whether it's with respect to the legal gaps, whether it's respect to the research gaps, and then to develop some kinds of strategies and so on based on that evidence. So it's it's an it's a it's a cyclic it's a cyclical approach where both the the national regional. Uh, processes are informing the global ones and then the global ones feed back to the, in the other direction. Thank you, Pratik. Um, Mark, would you also like to answer this question and then we'll move on to the next one. Sure. Uh, well, one quick answer is international standards. So I think one way of ensuring in global interoperability is that you might have a different risk profile or assessment as what you consider high risk in Singapore than in the UAE, than in the US, than in Japan, and in the UK. But if you uh, underpin what your um, 
proper behavior is or what you certify against for certification by common metrics and standards that emanate out of ISO and SC42, I think you said it was mentioned earlier, but SC42 is a good example of that. That at least ensures a degree of interoperability where if you're in, I was having conversations in Chile uh, a couple of weeks ago and they're you know considering their own regulatory approach, but they want to make sure that Chilean companies that build AI solutions or products to their local specs can export without having to re-engineer their solution when they enter another market, right? And then obviously for, for a multinational uh, company like ours, we want to make sure when we enter a market that we don't have to respec in, in every single market. So I think that's one way of ensuring interoperability. And then on the, the kind of global declarations and, and statements and so on, I think it's if you're going to want to build another one, it shouldn't be just so that there's a Canadian version or an Australian version of it, uh, so that you know you have 12 players instead of 11 on the field and a 55-yard field instead of a 50-yard field, just to make it slightly different. Uh, you see how you can build off of the existing work that's been done, and I think that's one thing that the UK have been doing well, at least with their summit, is starting from the White House commitments and essentially sending very detailed questionnaires. Uh, to companies and participants about how you take those to kind of a, a greater degree of granularity. And I think that's building off of work as opposed to trying to make it duplicative so you can put your national stamp on it. Thank you. Next question. Yes, one from Um On a une question en ligne qui dit AI is new and not widely understood by the public. How can we expect good AI regulation for publicly accountable institution if the public isn't ready to hold government account accountable? Is there a need for public education on the issues and trade-offs before we can expect regulation? Um, yes, I mean, I, I was going to say this is the comment that I, that I was saying earlier at the G7 panel is that, you know, really if, if we are talking about uh, what is this legis like? What is the risk of doing this legislation poorly? What is the risk of doing AI legislation poorly? I think a lot of it is not simply about standards, but it's about democratic capability. And I think this is the risk you see with, say, the rush to roll out a statement on generative AI or to pass ADA, is that we're losing those moments of education. And I think, to me, it's really important to say that, that not only, and I understand the kind of need for export and import, but like we are facing a kind of like bind where the literacy can be so low. You have, I think like an example like C11 was raised, which is on, around online broadcasting that was framed and, and discussed quite openly as a, for, as a form of online censorship, which really speaks to a gap about how do you actually talk about effective uh, governance here. And I think that this is the same risk that we might have with AI. Unless we're doing it well, unless we're building capability, then we're, we're going to be at a risk where it'll just be conversations about the Terminator nonstop. And so where do we go from there? And I think partially this is an accountability on kind of the government itself where our, much of our consultation approaches have been totally rudimentary. Like submit a form online and we'll hopefully read it. And, you know, maybe this is going to be something that might impact, but we can't tell you uh, how so? And I think that this really is putting, I think, obligations on, on seeing consultations as part of the democratic process that needs to be protected. And that partially this is, I think, one of the criticisms, respectfully, of the pan-Canadian AI strategy is that it didn't build in public education literacy as strongly as it should from the get-go. And so we're sitting here seven years after that thing's been launched, we're worrying about why everyday Canadians don't understand AI as well as they should. And I think that those are gaps that, that really speak to the kind of record of AI governance in Canada. Thank you. We have but, time for... But we, we also have problems in terms of signal and noise. I mean, if you're talking about AI and some of this is quantum where it's like, okay, chemical discovery, that is a real thing. It's a phenomenon in the world as we speak. It's not... It's, <laughs> it's hard to do, but it exists. Um, so that's AI, and then we also have something basic like if your kid's doing a report on Animal Farm and it's a fake quote, how do they know if it's fake or not? What's ground truth in terms of everyday instruments? So we've got AIs that are supposed to be helpmates, and then we've got AIs that are doing reinforcement learning and creating new ways of doing things or new objects in the world. So we've got an incredible spectrum 
of things. So even if we narrow it and just speak to Fenwick's point in terms of the tools that are regularly available to regular people, can we work on that? Can we actually invest time and money to make sure there's some understanding? When do you fact check something? I mean, we, we've, we've not done a good job with that previously, but we actually have an opportunity to do that now. And we do have the continuing problem that the same five people who Mark has said are doing everything already, they can't also do that. No. So some of this is resources. Thank you. We have time for one last quick question. Hello. Oh, hi, I'm Ross from Digital Moment. Uh, thank you for the talk. And as someone representing a youth servicing organization that tries to teach on the ethics of AI, uh, starting with teens, you know, we have a lot of tools that support us in similar ways. Uh, I think to the UN Sustainable Development Goals from 2015. Um, and as you have mentioned before with the issues of capacity and that this is a decade long commitment for us, um, should we be expecting something from similar to the UN Sustainable Development Goals as it relates to AI to kind of help build this capacity for youth? And similarly within the education system, should we take a horizontal or a vertical approach, as you have mentioned, with regards to specific courses. Uh, just as you said, students that I work with feel like essay writing has now become obsolete. Is there a relevant ethical conversation for AI within an English class now? Um, well, on the SDGs, um, just two weeks ago at the UN General Assembly, you know, we had, um, I want to say a full weeks worth of various events and summits and meetings about how we leverage AI towards achieving the SDGs. And there's lots and lots of examples on that side that um, I'd be happy to, to, to provide you or that you can, can pull from, from work that's happening there. Um, on educating on AI, there's various programs uh, that people have put forward. And it seems like your organization's accessing a fair few of those. We have a program called Machine Learning University that we've partnered with Coursera to make just such levels from super introductory to very advanced of how you can go and learn more about how uh, AI is built and how you can leverage it and so on. And others are providing kind of similar similar programs that I think, again, don't have to necessarily reinvent the wheel, we can leverage a lot of that type of content and work to, to move forward. And then on the vertical versus horizontal, again, if we consider like, and many bills do consider AI and education as being high risk, right? Just that definition. but. You know, my, I'm thinking of my son's class that uses like a, a smart board on, on the wall. That's, that includes many components of AI in it, right? So if you said, well, that classroom, that public classroom is gonna have to go through a third party audit with Accenture to get certified to be able to use that board because you defined it too broadly is a problem versus like a very specific application in education that might be actually high risk for which we wanna put the right types of guardrails in place. I think whenever we talk about the actual use case, it's a lot easier to then figure out what do we want to tackle and what are the right tools to, to bring forward. I'll pass it to Ben for a really quick last note. I'll, I'll say two things quite quite quickly is that we've we've made investments in AI and like we are also dealing with whether we've made similar and sufficient investments in public education. And I think that that's one of the things to be held in parallel. And I think, you know, in my son's classroom, they're randomly using Class Dojo because they don't have the resources and this is how I'm connecting. And I don't know if they've even done a privacy audit, which freaks me out. And so I actually think that the last thing to say is that as educators, as an educator, I think part of what we have to push back against is the automatability of our students. And I think we're dealing with a, cul a culture that has kind of assumed that people are so easily to automate because general purpose intelligence is just around the corner. And I really think that part of our responsibility is to, to champion how our students have learned and their, their, their capabilities beyond, I think, the rudimentary functions of maybe job skills. Well, that c comes to an end. Thank you very much for the lively conversation and thank you to our panelists. Uh, thank you to the organizers. Some quick housekeeping notes. Uh, we invite you to have lunch in the bistro area outside uh, the main room. And additional seating will be available in the breakout room uh, and room number six. And please return to the plenary room after lunch for 1.35. Or, thank you.
Thank you. Bye-bye.